All right, let me start by praying. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, this day that commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we thank you so much for that and the good news in it. We pray for your blessing on this class as we look for this last time at the subject of inerrancy, that we would treasure your word, reverence your word, and even though you no, need no defense, your word needs no defense in itself, yet we are blind and deaf if left to ourselves, and certainly those who assail our faith, as your word says, need to be answered. And so we pray that you would help us to do that. In this subject of the New Testament's use of the Old Testament, Lord, open up our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this is the last of the weeks on inerrancy. This is the sixth category, sixth and final category that I, uh, are alleged errors. And this one is the alleged error of misquotations of the old by the new. And by misquotations, I'm going to mean a couple things. And really the, the nature of the question here is, as I suggested, whether the New Testament authors uh, erroneously use. That's a broader way to say it maybe a more accurate way to say it, whether they erroneously use the Old Testament by, one of these ways, false quotation or citation or interpretation. You could say whether they're pay, playing fast and loose with Old Testament passages. But there's different ways to do that. But I've got to spend some time here, and it's really going to follow something we already looked at with the inspiration of Scripture, with divine and human authorship. If we understand that, we'll understand this concept that I'm going to call full meaning, because that's what's going to be misunderstood in all of these cases. Cases of allegedly fanciful misquotations, in other words, the New Testament author is, is just like one of those medieval exegetes, and he's going in there allegorically, or he's, and you're looking back, that's not what the Old Testament author meant. That's the critic saying that. Or, these will be shorter categories here, whether or not they falsely ascribe to one author or part of Scripture something that maybe belonged somewhere else, or something that's nowhere at all. And by the time we get there, I'm just going to use two examples that show two different ways that you could mean this. Okay, so let's get right to it with this background information. Uh, you might recall whether it's a little bit in the eschatology class, but really when we're talking about inspiration and when we introduced inerrancy, I mentioned that a realist doctrine of Scripture is going to be one that says, okay, the words are all inerrant. They're all divine words insofar as God inspires them through the human author. However, the purpose of those words is to point to things, concepts, but ultimately things that God means by them. And we saw that why that's important for inspiration. What we're going to see now is why it's important for inerrancy as well. We've already seen one reason why it's important for inerrancy when we looked at textual variants and translations. We saw that different translations, even in one language, even in the English language, you'll say, well, the ESV doesn't say that the way the King James says that, what's going on? And you look at it and you're like, in most cases, they mean the same thing. Now, there are exceptions to that, as we saw, so you've got to work that out through uh, textual criticism. But we saw one reason why that's important. But the, the payoff was that words are particular signs for universal things. Another implication of that is that objective meaning, and I have a picture here, and both of these pictures, in the example that I'm going to use, and in the proof text I'm going to use, I'm going to show that this is actually taught in Scripture, in both of the pictures, you have identical pictures. And I could have made this more complex, but I don't want to do that. I just want to keep it simple. We've seen this picture before. The bigger circle is divine meaning. In other words, everything in that circle is what God means. Notice that the smaller circle of the inspired author is not outside of that. We're not going to pit divine meaning against human meaning. We're going to recognize that everything the human author who is inspired means is also God breathed. However, it does not follow that the human author deliberately or intentionally or consciously, that's the better word, consciously understands everything that God means by it. And there are all sorts of examples of that in the scriptures. We're applying them 
to the Old Testament use, or sorry, the New Testament use of Old Testament scriptures. So notice that these are not what we would call logically coextensive circles. The human meaning circle is inside of the divine meaning circle. And let me give you an example first, and I'm going to purposely use an example that's not prophecy so that we don't also get the idea that this is just some special rule so you Christians can come in later and reinterpret prophecy. No, it's not a special rule at all. This is a very normal thing. So I'm going to take an example that has nothing to do with prophecy. It's just a straight teaching. This is Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, and he's posing a question to the Corinthians. He says this, Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles, and the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas. Now, what's the context of this question? It's a series of questions that Paul asks that are rhetorical questions. It seems to be pushing back against an accusation that Paul was fielding against himself. The accusation that was, Paul, you're a little bit of a moocher. And he's pushing back on that in a couple of ways. And to answer this, he asserts liberties that he and the other apostles have, but which he himself is not going to use because he doesn't want to give his opponents an inch to accuse him. So he's bringing up things like marriage, though he himself was not. That's the context. That's the meaning. It's a rhetorical question, and the answer is yes, they do have those rights. Now, Here's my thought experiment. Suppose somebody came along centuries later, say somebody like me, because I'm the kind of person that would ask this question and argue with a Roman Catholic. Suppose somebody comes along centuries later and argues to a Roman Catholic that those who minister in the church may be married, just as Peter clearly was, as evidenced in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Let me, let me make it even clearer in application to our question today. What if I said it this way? What if I said, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. So I argue that to a Roman Catholic. I say that ministers may be married as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Would anybody here have any trouble with that? Raise your hand if you object to my use of that verse. I'll give everybody a second. <laughs> now let me play devil's advocate. I, I agree with you. You should not have raised your hand. I think it was a legitimate use. But suppose somebody came and said, wait a minute, Paul doesn't say that. That's not what Paul says in that verse. Paul never says anything about Rome, never says anything about priests, never says anything about uh, priests allowing to be married, though it uh, does say, it. what would be the problem with that if somebody said that Paul doesn't say? What I want to show you is that every single instance of this objection to the New Testament use of the old is making that same mistake. So if you can catch the mistake, what is meant by the word says? As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, and if someone playing devil's advocate was being pedantic if he said, Paul doesn't say those exact words. In fact, it's, it's out of context. So here's the problem. Conservative evangelicals, we often pride ourselves in two perfectly true principles. But I think the way we do it is very misleading. It blinds us to the limitations of those principles. And the principles I'm referring to, one is called the grammatical historical interpretive method, or the grammatical historical method or way of interpreting. In other words, everything we see is we're after the question, what does the human author mean? He's the inspired author. And that, by the way, that, that's exactly the right place to start. You don't want to and care about our feelings, or, or even how you apply the verse at first. We want to know what the author intended. It's a good, true principle. Okay, so hold that under your, head, under your hat. The other principle I'm referring to is the priority of context. For example, in the expression that such and such is taken out of context. You can see the problem with the person that says, Paul doesn't say that in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. You're taking that out of context. Okay, what does that person have in their mind? In their mind, the idea of human authorial con uh, intent or context is a very wooden idea. Their idea of what somebody says is a very, very wooden idea. So let me fast forward a little bit past that and say that what I'm calling full meaning is this whole circle. It takes into account the human meaning, 
but it doesn't leave it at that. It, and you say, well, that's, that's arbitrary, because then you can make, and here's the fear, you can make this mean whatever you want it to. No, you, you can't mean, uh, and, and so to make that point, and by the way, this just follows. If you've never used any of these words to describe this before, this just follows the idea that God is the ultimate author of Scripture. If God is the ultimate author of Scripture, all of it, He's also the ultimate meaner of Scripture, Okay. Uh, another example I could use that is prophecy is Psalm 16 that Peter quotes from in his sermon at Pentecost. And he said, David, who was a prophet, says this. And then you realize David didn't know all that he was saying. So did David really say that? How many times do we say about the Psalms, is David talking about David or is he talking about Christ? If you have a wooden idea of context, you can't allow him to be talking about Christ because he never says the words, the Christ to come or the, the Son to come or something like that in exactly those ways. He never tells you, David never stops and says, I'm, now I just want you to know I'm talking about Jesus here, I'm not talking about me, okay? So here's my proof text. Here's a verse that specifically teaches this, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. And, and notice, and I'm going to read the whole thing, but notice as I read it that the inspired authors knew enough to mean what they meant. So that circle's there. They meant every word of it. It was all true because it's divinely inspired. Yet, even though they were desiring to know, they did not know all that God meant. So let me read the verse now. This is what we're after in this verse. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace of that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. In the things that have now been announced to you, through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. What's Peter saying there? He's saying in the New Testament, yeah, let's, let's do that. Peter's over there. He's the guy writing over there. And then let's just pick David. It doesn't matter, any of the Old Testament prophets. Peter's saying that when they wrote these things to you, they were talking to you about things that would be opened up more fully. So you'll see, so I could put a dotted line here, back there in the Old Testament, this would be solid. It's broken open to you, but they searched diligently. They wanted to know more than they did know, meaning there was more in what they were writing than they did know. So, so you see that. Um, Peter's saying, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, that God meant more in what they were writing, in what they were writing. Um, that, that's the doctrine of progressive revelation is another uh, presupposition or premise that Christians have that teaches this same thing. And, and it doesn't mean as you go this way, there will be new truth that conflicts with that truth. That would be true about the Quran in Islam. However, in the Bible, what we mean by progressive revelation is something more like seeds, and Gerhardus Voss used this exact imagery when he talked about this. He said that there's an organic relationship between the old and the new. Well, how did Augustine say it famously? That the new is in the old concealed. Yeah. And the old is in the new revealed. Okay, so picture a, a flower on its side and the roots of it here and the stem, and then it's blossoming in the New Testament. And so that blossoming, though distinct from the stem, is organically related to it. It's the same DNA. It's uh, the, the genotype and the phenotype. The uh, information here is now... Um, issuing forth into all the traits of the body, except it's not a body, and into the traits of the fuller revelation. But there's nothing contrary. Okay, so that's the doctrine that we're operating off of 
And this immediately is going to answer all of these different objections about the, uh, the use. Now, Beale calls this diff- something different. He doesn't call it full meaning. He calls it canonical contextual approach. Canonical contextual approach. In other words, there's context is relative. There's concentric circles. You can't just say the context in a very wooden way. There's all kinds of contexts. The Bible's a big book. And it's written by an infinite author. And so these contexts are often overlapping. You know, it's a lot more like a Venn diagram, but a really, really busy one. And many circles are much bigger than other circles. Okay? Now, there's one other concept that people will bring into this to say that, well, actually, this is not weird at all. The Jews were already doing this by the first century. I think this is an important point, but I don't think you want to hang too much on it because different biblical scholars will, you know, inflate this this idea. Um, There is an idea called the Midrash Haggadah, and that this is really what the New Testament authors were doing when they used these Old Testament texts in this way. Let me give you a definition first, and I'm going to borrow from the Jewish Encyclopedia online to give us this definition because I think it'll be helpful. It says, Midrash Haggadah embraces the interpretation, illustration, or expansion in a moralizing or edifying manner of the non-legal portions of the Bible. So already there's something a little bit different about it, but similar idea. The word Haggadah, Aramaic Agada, means primarily the recitation or teaching of Scripture. In a narrower sense, it denotes the exegetic amplification. So again, it's that flower blossoming. That's what he means. Amplification of a biblical passage and the development of a new thought based thereupon. Now, when you say new, what are you thinking? Oh, new, different, hold on, distinct, but the same information giving you more and more and more fullness. Now, I said don't make too much of this. Um, The proper view toward the apostles' use of the Old Testament does not depend upon any influence from this school of thought. We only bring it up in these contexts to show that this is normal. This is a normal way that first century Jews interpreted the old. Now, there's wrong interpretations and there's right interpretations. But guess what? If you never heard about any of this and you were just interpreting a passage, there'd still be right interpretations and wrong interpretations. So the fact that the Jews were doing this and then they had this use and you'd say, well, those are not inspired writings. Yeah, I know, but all we're talking about is a method or a way of thinking. And God and the Holy Spirit is, is communicating to human beings through human, ordinary ways of thinking. Okay, so one more point by Beale, and he says that's interesting, and that's a good thing to to look at, but it really doesn't depend on that. He says there's another place to look. He says a good argument could be made that the interpretive method of the New Testament is rooted in the Old Testament's viable interpretive use of earlier Old Testament texts. Let me stop. What, What Beale just say in layman's terms, the Old Testament authors were already doing this. In the prophets, you would see servant of the Lord or exodus or things like that used in a metaphorical or figurative way. They were already pointing to the fact that those things back in the books of Moses were types and shadows of something more to come. So they were already adding to, giving you more information of what you saw at the beginning of the Bible. That's what Beale means by that. He says, and that various early Jewish communities practiced an interpretive approach shaped by the Old Testament's exegetical method, including the early Jewish Christian community. In other words, Beale is really saying, even that thing, the Midrash Haggadah, even that is borrowing, maybe falsely, but it's borrowing from the way the Old Testament writers already interpreted older Old Testament writings. Okay, that's the backdrop, and we needed that to see what's wrong with the critics' thinking. Let's look first at allegedly fanciful misquotations. And this is the biggest section because it's the most, it's the majority of what's meant. And these are the main famous texts that come into view. There's others that people will mention. But these are the most famous ones. And the leading evangelical critic, I'll put those in quotes because he taught at Westminster Seminary East, but then his view of inerrancy was not inerrancy uh, and not really orthodox in inspiration. Peter ends, he says this, he says, time and time again, the New Testament authors do some odd things by our standards with the Old Testament. I love how they they hang themselves with their own noose. Um, Yes, by our standards, that should have been your clue. 
What Enns does is he positions that traditional, what I mentioned was the grammatical historical interpretation of the Old Testament. In other words, what does the human author mean? In his historical context, according to ordinary rules of grammar, that's why it's called that, and Enns pits that method of interpretation against what he calls a Christotelic approach. So telos meaning end, and Christ, of course. And so reading the Old Testament, looking for Christ in the Old Testament, which ends at first is going to say that's what we should be doing. But he pits these against each other. See, for ends, the grammatical historical approach, in other words, look at what the Old Testament authors meant in their context, that would demand that both the Old Testament author and the New Testament author that's citing him if that method is true, they would have to mean the exact same thing. The circles would, there wouldn't be a bigger circle. There would just be two circles, and they would converge and, um, and eventually overlap completely. He would mean the exact same thing at every point that he means in every way. While the Christotelic approach would demand that the New Testament author is using the Old Testament text in a way that, this is Enz's quotes, in a way that is not related contextually to the original intention, and even, he says, not consistent with it. Enns makes this claim most boldly by saying, quote, New Testament authors were not engaging in the Old Testament in an effort to remain consistent with the original context and intention of the Old Testament author. So you see the difference between what Enns is saying, that if there's more here, it's contrary, as opposed to what we're saying here, there's more here, and it's the blossoming of what is there. So here, misquotation can mean literally missing the same words, or it may refer to misusing a quotation, even if the same words are reasonably followed. So let's begin with that latter kind, where it's the same words, but there's no way he's using it in the Old Testament context. And let's start with the passage that's received the most attention by G.K. Beale, and that is Matthew 2.15. The critics will say, which is misapplying Hosea 11.1. 1. How does Matthew see the prophecy being fulfilled? He says this in Matthew 2, 14 and 15. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And of course, those words are Hosea 11.1. 1. Now, what is the original context of the passage? Well, Hosea's prophecy is, is a condemnation of the northern kingdom of Israel. It's also a warning to the southern kingdom of Judah. And chapter 11 pauses from the material in chapter 4 through 10, which was this covenant lawsuit by which God, Yahweh, the husband, is suing, bringing this case against his unfaithful bride, Israel. But it stops there, and in chapter 11, it does a little historical reconnaissance. And the purpose is to show how much love and how much care God has shown to Israel in the past, so as to depict the treachery as being all the more blameworthy. And it's in that context when he says, when Israel was a child, already you should see that there is a metaphorical, figurative context that Hosea himself is speaking about Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. By the way, remember this when you speak to your Jewish neighbors and they say that Isaiah 53 and other passages, don't you Christians know that's not speaking about a singular person, Jesus, it's speaking about my servant Israel. Always respond with your first words, we know. Read the whole context throughout these books. Israel is being treated as, I call it, Adam 2.0. Adam failed as the servant of the Lord, as the son or child of God, and Israel is being put forward, in a sense, as a do-over. Now, God knew that Israel would fail too. So you have here, just picture this, Adam, Israel, Christ. And so God is speaking to Israel in the Old Testament passages already as if it is a singular person called my child 
or my son. And so at first glance, what looks like it's out of context, when you read the context, in other words, when you meet by context, not just the small wooden circle, but the larger circle of the way the Bible patterns this out. So Adam's sons were patterned after his likeness in Genesis 5, 1 through 3. He was patterned after an image of God, and so Adam's sons were called like that. So Israel stood in that line of Seth, Luke 3.38, the son of Adam, the son of God. In that very prophet, Hosea, in Hosea 6.7, he completes the analogy in terms of a covenant. He says, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant, there they dealt faithlessly with me. So the question is not whether Israel was patterned after Adam. The only question is in what ways. And the whole Bible pictures It sees Israel as Adam 2.0 and then Christ as the fulfillment. And in the Old Testament, you already have Israel being spoken of as the child or the son or the singular person of God, okay? So that's not strange at all. That's normal. I'll put that down. Second one, Matthew 2.6 misquotes Micah 5.2. Now, I know that comes before it in Matthew, but I'm doing this in order of how they're treated, at least here. The, the uh, prophecy itself, let's just read them side by side. Micah 5, 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. In Matthew 2, 6, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, leave out the part about ancient days, which wouldn't be problematic anyway for Matthew not to include that, or even the word Ephrathah being joined to Bethlehem, because again, this would be kind of like the women at the tomb we looked at a couple weeks ago. This would be complementary rather than contradictory information. There's just stuff in the prophecy that Matthew doesn't include. He, he gives you big picture stuff. The real issue for the critic comes with what appears to be a reversal of emphasis. The statement in Micah is about smallness in in Bethlehem, whereas it's reversed to greatness in Matthew, by no means the least. And uh, some will even seize upon the addition of the action shepherding ascribed to this ruler, but I would think that that's just a little bit of ignorance on the part of the critic. In the prophecy itself, it makes a connection between being a ruler and being a shepherd, so just for example, in other parts of the Bible, 1 Chronicles eleven two, 2, speaking to David, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You see that in the prophecy of the shepherd to come in Ezekiel 34 and elsewhere. But where does it do this in the prophecy itself? In Micah 5, 4, just two verses down, he shall stand and shepherd his flock. So Matthew's just taking that shepherd his flock from verse 4 and pulling it up into verse 2. He says, oh, well, it's out of order though. Okay, now you're just being desperate. So it is part of the idea but Matthew is compressing that information that in Micah is further spread out, okay? Now, there's, there's other things you can do with all of these. I'm giving you the bird's eye view of the way that they're interpreting these passages. And remember the example I used from 1 Corinthians 9, Paul, just as Paul says. That's why I went through that and labored that point. What does it mean to say, just as so-and-so says? Does it mean I am claiming that I'm going to give you the exact word order in the exact context they do, or am I saying the point I am currently making, they said this in some way. And sometimes it'll be multiple Old Testament authors. Galatians 3.16 is said to misquote Genesis, and they don't give a particular verse because what they have in mind is what they, and, and here's the problem. If they work it out even in their own sentence, they'll stumble because then they're forced to say, well, if you take the whole of Genesis 12 through 17, where God is making these promises to Abraham. But the moment they do that, they just hung themselves because God promises a lot to Abraham about the son. Let's work that out a little bit. Galatians 3.16, now the promises were made to Abraham, promises, that's already a clue, plural. You might want to look in more than one verse. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Now, what do they do with that? Well, in Genesis, it is to offsprings. That's true in some passages, and not true in others. 
Some of the promises, in fact, the main one that Abraham and Sarah were concerned with was what? For a son. Yes, there are offspring, multitudes, many nations. So there is an offspring plural. But the moment you make that objection, I just, I've considered that just so weird that that gets so much traction. Because the main promise being made to Abraham and, I, and, and Sarah is for a son. And that son is a type of Christ. And again, if you want to argue against that, say, no, it's not. It never says. And so then you're, you're changing your objection, which that's another class to talk about the types of Christ and, and defend that. But that's another objection at that point. Okay. So let's fast forward. Romans 11, 26 and 27 is said to misquote Isaiah 59, 20. And actually, uh, by the way, Always ask yourself, because 90% of these, and there's not many of them anyway, so 90% I'm just throwing that number up there, 9 out of 10 of these, ask yourself, wait a minute, does the New Testament author actually cite the verse itself, or is that in my Bible when I drag my cursor over it, or when I just look in the, in the column down below? And the answer is, oh, that's, that study Bible supplied that for me. Actually, the New Testament author is actually not even claiming that particular verse by itself. Exactly. So there goes 90% of these objections right in that. But Romans 11, 26 and 27 is said to misquote Isaiah 59, 20. But this is another case of multiple verses being treated together because in the Isaiah passage, it is true, it says all Israel will be saved and that is linked to a deliverer uh, and Zion. And this passage has the uh, coming to Zion Whereas Paul, it's from Zion. Or sorry, it's the other way around. Here, here's the way, let me just read it. Uh, Paul says the deliverer will come from Zion. Whereas in this other passage, it, it says to Zion. So this is kind of a hybrid objection. Remember I said there were some of those? This is one that says it's misusing the passage. And they'll say, and that would also make it a contradiction, they'll say. Okay. Well, there's two other texts from the Psalms that Paul can be drawing from. Psalm 14.7, Psalm 53.6 say, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. So it's, and those exact words are in multiple places, that salvation in Israel would come out of Zion. And by the way, there's other ways that the Old Testament prophets say that he will be one of you, he will come from among you, and so on and so forth. So very, very interesting. It should also be remembered that in Isaiah if he is drawing from Isaiah because of the other words, um, there's some, some central images that would contribute to this idea as well. The Holy One of Israel, who is called the Redeemer in chapter 43, the servant who is Christ. So there's all these ideas that Paul could be drawing from, and the idea is that when he alludes back to that, he's not saying there's one verse that says this in this exact order, just like this. That, that's never the case in any of these passages. All right, and then the one that I think is the toughest to explain, Paul's use of Psalm 68, 18 in Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. I say toughest because, and strangely enough, it's not the one that gets the most mileage. I think these are more famous because they're Christmas passages. They're in the Gospels, so skeptics know where to find those, and a lot of them don't know where to find this, but this is the one that seems like there's the most amount of license being used, Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. Sorry, let's start with the psalm, uh, the psalm itself. Psalm 18, 68, 18. It says, You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts from among men, even among the rebellious. Sorry, receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Paul, when he uses that verse, reverses the order of who is giving to whom. Therefore, it says, this is Paul, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? It is interesting right there that Paul further interprets in the parenthetical part, at least the ESV puts it in parentheses, he, he tells you further what he means by ascended and descended. When you read the psalm, if you're an Old Testament reader, you're like, is he, 
Is he talking about the king? That's usually what kings would do. They would ascend to a place and they would receive tribute. But he's clearly talking about God. He's talking about God, but he's talking about a king. But why would he be talking about God if he's the one that ascended? Is he talking about him ascending on the mountain? And there's language like that in the psalm. So the meeting place with uh, human beings or with his people, sorry. Um, Some people want to resolve this by comparing the Septuagint to the Targum as Paul's source. The better resolution is what we've been looking at. It's simply to note that the psalm references a victory of the Lord whereas the context of Ephesians 4 is Christ giving gifts to the church for the purpose of building it up. So Paul's already fast-forwarding to a very narrow application of the body of Christ. He's doing ecclesiology. So the victory is already being won. Here he's just flashing back in verses 8 and 9 to show you the foundation of it. But the Bible itself gives you theological categories to see how both are happening at two different stages. You know, that's, I think, I think, that's why Paul uh, unpacks it further and said, what does it mean that he ascended, but that he descended? He's giving you more of an interpretation as to, first of all, who the psalm was talking about. Who, who, who descends and then ascends? What does Jesus say in John 3? No one ever ascended, but he who descended. So part of what Paul's doing is cluing you in, at least the Jewish reader, as to what they were reading all those years. And so the context of Ephesians 4 is Christ giving the gifts of the church after he had already ascended. When does Christ give the Holy Spirit and then multiply the gifts to the church? Pentecost is the sign of it, but he had to ascend first. What does he say in the gospel several times to them about the gift of the Spirit and him giving the Spirit and so on? He has to ascend first. Okay, so the victory is won by the cross and the empty tomb. He then ascends receiving tribute, and then he gives those gifts. say, but... The psalmist didn't know all that. Your story's changing. Your original objection, and this is why I say to all of them, your original objection is that these words contradict or that these words are contrary or that in this case, he couldn't have meant all that. I grant that David didn't know all that. But now we're starting to talk about two different things. Um, all right. One more on, on misquotations. It can take the form of allegations of misuse. <clears throat> so 2 Corinthians 6, 2, which I don't have, misapplies Isaiah 49, 8. Specifically, Paul's applying to individuals what Isaiah is clearly aiming at at Israel as a nation. Same kind of objection that I mentioned before about the servant in Israel. Uh, Paul says, for he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Um, Reformed people have an easier time with this because we understand covenant theology and that the, applic- the promises to Israel are also applied to individuals. By the way, the promises to Israel as a nation back then were also applied to individuals back then, so that's not weird or new. So that's the kind of objection that I put in the category of desperate last attempt to revive that category. Really briefly on the other, because they're smaller categories, but one of them is uh, beginning of Mark. This is what we call false ascriptions. So different author, he got that wrong. He falsely attributes to Isaiah what's from Malachi. In the opening of the gospel in verses 2 and 3 of Mark 1, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. By the way, the substance of John the Baptist's message there, the second half of the verse, is from Isaiah chapter 40. So that is from Isaiah. What he's doing is he's combining the promise of the coming one, in this case, John the Baptist, who will go before me. But then the whole point, the gospel message that he preaches is in Isaiah. And it's in several forms in Isaiah, but in those words, it's clearly Isaiah 40 verse 3. Okay, so that's an easy one. And then there's another, one other one, just to give the example. Sorry, Matthew 27, we just saw it, verses 9 and 10, falsely attributes to Jeremiah what's from Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. So in the gospel it says, Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now, some apologists will say that some prophets, especially the minor prophets, were said to be speaking in the spirit of such and such a prophet, namely the major prophets. 
But there's a rationale for that. They're talking about the same theme, or they prophesy at the same time. In this case, it wouldn't be the same time, but they're prophesying the same theme. Okay, so admittedly, that, just like a lot of the other ones, takes some theological background. Um, but again, it's not going to satisfy a lot of modernists that want to say that no, when somebody says the word says, they have to mean chapter, verse, you know, all these things, a standard that they don't hold themselves to in normal conversation or even academic literature in a lot of cases, uh, but they have a double standard when it comes to the Bible. And then finally, allegedly ascribed nothings. I don't know what else to call it. And these are different in a sense. One of them is going to, in other words, there's a prophecy that you're like, the Old Testament? Where, where's that in the Old Testament? I don't see that anywhere. And then another one that some critics are going to say is based on a legend. So I'm using that category to describe both of these. Um, let's look first at Matthew 2.23, and these are our last two, about the word Nazarene. The whole passage says this in Matthew, and he went and lived in the city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, I think the best answer may be that Isaiah 9.1's prophecy that he would be from Galilee is referencing the same location, and the emphasis is the same. The lowliness of Nazareth, the town, and Galilee, the larger region, are being treated synonymously by Matthew. Or the answer might lie two chapters later in Isaiah 11, where he says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch, and this is the, maybe the play on words, uh, the Nazir, which is a form of Nazir, which you don't have to know any Hebrew to know, hey, that sounds like Nazareth, so maybe there's a play on words there. And that's what Matt Slick argues, and some others do as well. He says, in Hebrew, the word for branch is netzer, which letters are included in Nazareth. It seems that Matthew was referring to the branch, the Nazarene, in turn a reference to God's raising up the Messiah. Clearly, Matthew was not exegeting Isaiah, but it seems he was referring to the branch. So sometimes exegesis of a passage, or many passages, sometimes can take the form of allusion, or not illusion, I, but allusion with an A, and um, somebody could be making, a, uh, whether it's a, in a play on words or some other kind of subtle typological reference. And yeah, we do things like that all the time in regular human speech, but we apply a double standard to the Bible because of our emotions. There's other resolutions, um, but I think they strain too much. Uh, for example, Calvin makes reference to Chrysostom's appeal to a potential lost book. Calvin says, by quoting a passage in Josephus, in which he states that Ezekiel left two books. Uh, then he, and now you say, well, that, if, that's extra, if that's true, that's extra canonical. But again, remember Jude, remember Paul in Acts 17, remember the book of Jashar. That's not actually inherently problematic. I just don't think it's the, uh, the best answer. Um, then Calvin doesn't go there. Calvin, take, he just mentions that, but he takes the side of Martin Bootser, who says, uh, who thinks that the references of passage in the book of Judges, which might be where some people's mind go to Samson, the child shall be called a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Now, that's a different thing, uh, but that's Judges 13.5. Uh, Calvin says, these words no doubt were spoken with regard to Samson, but Samson is called the redeemer or deliverer of the people only because he was a figure of Christ. So Calvin's resolution is to combine allusion with typology, but I'm not sure that's the, that's the best answer there. Last one is, sorry, 1 Corinthians 10.4. Uh, critics will say, and Peter ends is one. Peter ends, who I mentioned, will say this about 1 Corinthians 10.4, that it's based on a Jewish legend and not on a specific text in the books of Moses. Well, um, Paul does not cite an original speaker, and um, his explanation in that passage is that the rock was Christ, and that's said by ends and others to have rooted the concept in the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness that it's a Jewish legend of a well that followed them throughout the wilderness. Now, let's stop right there. Aside from a miracle, neither rocks nor wells literally follow you in the wilderness, right? So even if you appeal to a Jewish legend about a well following them, that would still be metaphorical or figurative, wouldn't it? Okay, so they really haven't shifted the goalpost into saying why this would be a more reasonable explanation anyway. Anyway, 
it's probably maybe you need to develop the figure a bit more. Now, um, Beale, in responding to ends, replies that there is only one Jewish reference in this tradition that plausibly is dated around the first century A.D., but even part of this reference is clouded by textual uncertainty, and he mentions a pseudo-philo, so not really philo, who wrote this. So that's, that's your best resource here. But you might wonder why this would even matter. Um, as I said, Jude supports his teaching with an appeal to an extra-canonical source. Paul did on Mars Hill. So this ought to prompt us to consider whether or not we're being intellectually lazy when it comes to understanding where the burden of proof is. But in any event, there actually is a passage of Scripture that helps in the same way or similar way that I said about how Hosea uses Exodus and so forth. And that is in Psalm 78. In Psalm 78, verses 14 through 16, it says, In the daytime he led them with a cloud. Let's stop there. Who's the he? It's God. And he's leading them in the form of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He says, he splits rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Let's think about that for a second. You have both of the elements that you need for Paul's allusion right there. You have a rock, and out of the rock came the water. But you also have the, uh, the, the thing that actually did move around with Israel, that God manifested Himself, His presence in, namely the cloud and the fire. So isn't it more reasonable to say that what followed them was what the Bible says followed them, and that Paul's not actually claiming that the rock followed them? In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 10 more carefully, you'll find Paul's actually not claiming that. He's not claiming that the rock is what followed them around. He's saying Christ was the rock, and therefore, it was Christ who was following them or leading them, really, throughout the wilderness. So Paul is mixing metaphors. But if you're a careful reader, you'll realize that he's not actually saying that the rock is metaphorically following them, instead of, in the Jewish legend, the well. This is just really poor reading, uh, and, and it's, a not, it's not a spiritual reading of the text as well, because it, it, it's called a spiritual rock by Paul in that passage. At any rate, last point, Beale concludes this. If Enns is correct about the legendary nature of 1 Corinthians 10.4, then not only was Paul unaware that what he was recording was legend, as Enns actually says, but if he had known, he would have repudiated it as he does in 1 Timothy. Is this really a likely scenario? Okay, so that's his response. I'll cut it there. Like I said, there's only a couple of real categories here, but this is the last week on inerrancy, so we'll get to authority in the last third of our class on the normal parts of the doctrine of Scripture, but I think it's worth it to go through these different kinds of objections against inerrancy. Any questions at all? And it could be about this week or any of the preceding weeks about those kind of alleged errors or comments. or nothing. <laughs> All right, well, next week we will get to biblical authority, and we'll only do one week on that, and then sufficiency, which we'll do at least two weeks, because uh, sola scriptura, we have to see that from scripture and from history, because there's two different kinds of objections to, and, and what is sola scriptura. And then finally, the clarity of scripture is where we'll end the class. But uh, I'll pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for it, its inerrancy, that is, your word says, the word of the Lord is perfect. It is like silver refined on the ground seven times. It's pure in every way. Help us, Lord, to revere your truth and every single word in it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.